Hey guys, it's Kirsten with the Overmatch Podcast. I am your host today and doing the thing that I actually despise the most, which is talking. But Kevin wants me to do a podcast about policing where I just talk to the camera and answer your questions. So bear with me and hopefully we'll get through this. Thank you so much for everyone who responded. There were some phenomenal questions that I'll go through almost all of them. Let's get into it. So first question is, why did you leave law enforcement? Well, I never thought I'd be that person. I went into policing, wanted to be a police officer since I was five years old. And then I met the love of my life, got married and had children. And those children I was not seeing very often. I was on um, double callback units and I just worked a ton. And I never thought I would be a, a mom who stayed home, that nothing wrong with that, it's a great thing, but I just loved my job, loved what I did, and certainly thought that that's what I would keep doing. But babies changed things and totally changed me. And it broke my heart not being able to uh, be with my daughter more and raise her. And so we found a way that thankfully Kevin was looking for a female firearms instructor and the rest is history. And I'm so grateful for it. I miss policing. I loved my job, um, hated the politics, but loved the actual job when you got to actually police and miss it. But I'm so grateful I got to do and accomplish the things that I did because I really don't have any regrets and raising my kids is the most important thing in my life and the most important impact I can have. So that is why I left. Uh, next question, at what point in your career did you decide to try out for SWAT? When I decided to become a police officer, that was my goal. I knew for a fact I wanted to do and be the best of the best in the policing world, which uh, typically is your SWAT team. So that was always a goal and I did what I needed to do to be able to succeed at that. Uh, what are the most common calls seen by police? Um, you know, I think when I became a police officer, I had this Hollywood version in my head that made me think that we would, you know, have heroic moments where we just come in and save the day. And unfortunately, the reality is what we really do mostly is we pick up the pieces. People are calling us on the worst day of their lives. And a horrible, traumatic event has happened to them, and we're the ones who show up. And typically, the crime has already been committed, and we're just there to pick up the pieces, maybe try to solve it. Um, so that, I think, would be the most uh, significant difference from my civilian perspective before I actually became a police officer. Now. I graduated college early and went right into policing. So I was young, uh, naive, but that is something that when you watch police shows or movies and things like that, you always see like the, the coolest, best stuff. But the reality is those moments happen, but not as frequently as they make it out to be typically. I think the most common calls, meaning the most frequent, would be traffic accidents and domestic violence calls. And domestic violence calls, you basically feel like a, a counselor. You know, I was a 21 year old kid telling people in their 60s, 70s, whatever, how to get along, you know, and it's just insane. Uh, domestic violence are, are very, very dangerous calls to go on. They are um, one moment, one person hates another person. And the next moment when you put them in handcuffs, that person now hates you for handcuffing that person. So they're just very complicated. There's um, a lot of frustration just from the policing standpoint that we have to uh, deal with some of that a lot. But I would say those are probably the most frequent calls that police officers deal with, mostly across the board, at least in a larger metropolitan city. Well, one of my good friends sent a, a statement and not as much of a question, he said, we don't need to be in this job as long as we are. I couldn't agree more. Military is a 20 year retirement. Some police departments are 20, very, very few, very rare. Uh, some are 25, also more rare. Mo 
mostly you're dealing with a 30 year retirement, 30 years in a job that is very, very, very negative. Like I said, we're dealing with people on the worst day of their lives. They're dealing with the, the worst moments. It needs to change. Uh, I'm trying not to be negative, but I, I don't see it changing because we're losing police officers constantly right now in this uh, climate that we're in. So I don't see a 30 year retirement being reduced, though it should, but oftentimes it doesn't matter. Um, well, I won't be negative, but I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> A uh, good question is, does my attitude and energy level influence how the officer interacts with me during a stop? A hundred percent. We are constantly reading body language, demeanor, um, what is being said, what's not being said. There's so many different things that we're picking up on. And that is part of what I teach, which is situational awareness. You know, how do you prepare for something and see it coming to give you just that extra second to shorten that reactionary gap and be able to respond appropriately and survive the situation. So yes, if you're super amped and super stressed out and it doesn't really make sense for whatever we're dealing with, that's gonna set off some red flags for us. We're, we're gonna wonder why you're so stressed out. Now, I could get pulled over right now and I'm gonna get a little nervous. I'm gonna be stressed out and I did this job for so long, right? Because nobody likes getting pulled over, but a normal level of nervousness is one thing. It's when it escalates and there's not really reason for that that makes us think what else is there that's going on. So yes, how you respond with us, how you interact with us is absolutely going to affect how we see what's going on and interact with you throughout the stop. Um, best advice I have, be polite, be respectful, obey all the commands, be respectful, keep your hands where officers can see them so that you know, you're know you not fidgeting around and making them wonder why. And if you don't agree with something that happened, which can absolutely happen, that is what court is for later. Save your arguments, your retaliation, whatever it is until court and argue it there because there's really no sense in doing it during the traffic stop. That's just gonna make it look like you're uh, you have something else going on. What are the changes in policing from year one to when I left? Gosh, that's huge. When I started versus when I left, and give a, a brief background. So I was with Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department for over 12 years. Throughout that time, I started on patrol. I did, I was third shift in multiple divisions. And um, to get a sense of the different kind of environments, I was in, you know, the most violent division for a time and I was in a division that was just one of the largest. I did patrol for years which is so essential. Anybody who is trying to get into this profession do that and do that for an extended period of time because that's when you learn the most. That's when you really develop the foundation in your ability to police and police well. Uh, after a some patrol time, I went to a essentially a street drug task force for that division in multiple divisions that I worked in as well. And that was just more the basic street level drugs, guns, things like that, and helped develop some of my uh, communication skills, detective work to investigate certain things and uh, kind of jumped me into my next career, which during that time, I was on the Dignitary Protection Unit, which if you don't know, is essentially there were the guys who stand there in the suits with politicians when they come into the Charlotte area. And, you know, we develop plans and ops to uh, make sure that everything runs smoothly to protect whoever the individual is. And I, I got some incredible opportunities and met some very, very well-known politicians and uh, learned a lot about developing an operational plan for uh, an event like that. Then I went to uh, a role, it was called the trap unit, which essentially is like, we, in, we not only investigated sprees, which is multiple crimes all across the Charlotte and Mecklenburg County area, 
and also were kind of like a warrant task force and we would go after uh, persons who committed, you know, youth crimes related stuff and some other uh, semi-violent crimes and it was an incredible experience where I got to learn so much about uh, surveillance and investigation and just a huge realm of things. And during that time is when I tried out for the SWAT team uh, when I was just three years on and didn't make it. And it was a great learning experience. Learned what I needed to work on, uh, met a couple people who were willing to help me and taught me a ton of what I know today. And then made it when uh, a couple years later when they had another tryout and was on the SWAT team for seven years. And it was an incredible experience to do the things that I did, have the training that I had. And I just feel honored to be able to pass on that knowledge that I was so fortunate enough to learn to um, my students and the people who come and train with us. It's um, an incredible experience to be able to pay it forward like others did for me. So, uh, but with that, going back to the question, changes in policing. When I started, we wrote up arrest sheets on a pieces of paper. By the time I ended, it was all in a computerized system. Uh, so, you know, obviously the technology and equipment advanced, you know, things like tasers and uh, the shotgun versus the rifle. You know, all the vehicles had shotguns in their cars. And then by the end of it, everyone now pretty much has a patrol rifle and shotguns aren't really... Uh, prevalent anymore. Um, we started with dash cams and now there's body worn cameras that you wear on your your actual uniform uh, which makes a huge difference because a dash cam can only show so much whereas the body worn camera goes wherever you are. So many things in technology just for investigative purposes which I don't want to go into all those details but there's a lot of things that have developed over from social media to um, internet sites to uh, communication sites and so many IP addresses and all these other different things. So that was definitely uh, has advanced throughout the years. And even something as simple as, you know, iron sites versus every, most everyone um, is moving toward the red dot, though not everyone has yet. But, you know, iron sites are great for accuracy. And it's so important to have that that fundamental, especially if the technology goes down. But the red dot just makes you so much faster, and it's silly for officers not to have that 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 little bit of a step up during a serious confrontation. Um, training training differs. That's changed over the years. It's certainly gotten better, and we do things safer than we used to do, which is obviously a benefit for everyone. And I would say hiring standards are much different. Again, I don't want to get too negative, but hiring standards when I started, even when I started, and certainly guys before me were high. You had to be um, good. You had to be. You had to be a good person. You had to have uh, very little in your background. You had to be in shape. You had to work hard. You had to have references. You, there was a lot that went into it. Uh, I'm sure it goes without saying that those standards have fallen dramatically. We're losing a lot of officers. The defund the police movement destroyed policing and is destroying our cities. And you're seeing a huge violent crime increase, not only because police officers don't feel backed, uh, the, the soft on crime approach that is happening in our cities, we can do all of this work in weeks and weeks of surveillance or investigation and make an arrest and that person will be out and back on the streets doing exactly what they were doing before we're done with the paperwork. And that is the reality of it. There are men that I have arrested that were 65 plus charges before and even more than that. There are murder suspects out on an ankle monitor right now. Um, so yeah, that's, um, certainly 
disheartening to say the least for officers who work so hard to do their job. But at the end of the day, we can only do what we can do, right? We're not in charge of the court system. We're not in charge of the judges. We're not in charge of any of that. We have to do the best job that we can. And when it falls through the cracks because of other people, at least we did all we could. But I can tell you that the relaxation of the standards is giving, is developing a different caliber of an officer. Um, it's amazing. When I tried out for SWAT, there was over 80 people that tried out and they took five of us. By the next tryouts, it was like 60. And then by the next ones, it, it dropped to 20 and less, less than. Because people don't want to work harder for something. We don't get paid more. You know, we, we get the benefit of more training and doing um, some amazing stuff. But there's no, like, exterior, you know, m motive that some people may want, like, extra pay and things like that. Uh, and people just don't want to do extra for nothing. So... The relaxation of standards has been a, a bad thing, a bad thing. You're seeing more officers that can't physically do the job, that can't mentally do the job, that um, not only does the police department suffer because of that and the good officers who are out there that can't rely on these new people, but the community suffers. The community suffers because you now have people that sometimes you can't trust that are being arrested for fraud that are being arrested for money laundering, that are being arrested for other inappropriate behavior because you relax the standards. It has internal and external consequences. And um, it's a shame, it's a shame. But when you defund the police and you take money away from uh, the ability to train officers up better, to get good officers in there by having a higher pay that will make, you know, the good ones want to be there, you're only hurting the public. You're, you're doing a disservice. So I'll just leave that at that. Um, you know, I think another aspect that comes along with that is the fact that we're coddling suspects now. Criminals are committing crimes and somehow the narrative is, oh, well, it's not their fault. Well, I'm sorry, last time I checked, if I knowingly and willingly go and commit a crime and steal a wallet or hold somebody at gunpoint, that's on me. I made that decision. If I go out right now and I speed and I get pulled over, that's my bed that I need to rest in because I made it. That's totally not how the saying goes, but you guys know what I mean. But the fact that we're coddling these criminals now, giving them a slap on the wrist, they're just getting right back out and doing the exact same thing again, why why is that a deterrent they're not there's no punishment they know that they can literally be arrested for multiple felonies and be out before i'm even done with my paperwork and they laugh at us for it they truly do they will say well i'll be out before you finish all that paperwork and i just looked at them and i would say yeah you're right you're right and that's a shame that's a shame i think another aspect that leads to a huge change in policing is the villainization of police when I started, we were not the monsters that were portrayed as now. And a lot of that has to do with uh, the way the media is. And the media is wrong for how they report crimes that are committed or officer-involved incidents that happen. The reality is that policing is not a pretty job. It's not what people want to see. Ignorance is bliss and people don't want to know that side of reality, that side of the world. But that's not a, a choice that we have. We have to deal with it. And it's not always a pretty thing. And sometimes you have to, you have to get the job done and go home at the end of the night. And for someone to micro put, put a split second decision in a life and death moment under a microscope that makes, uh, truly makes monsters out of police officers is not only unfair, unjust, but it's doing a huge disservice to police officers across the nation right now. A police officer is shot every 21 hours right now, 21 hours, not even every day, every 21 hours. 
That is unbelievable. And that is a war on police that is because of many of the things I already said. And a huge part of it is us being portrayed as these monsters that we just aren't. We aren't. Is there a, a bad percentage in, in every profession? Absolutely. There are dirt bags in every profession across the world, whether it's teachers, doctors, journalists, presidents, whatever. And you're going to have bad eggs, but that is not the majority. That is the minority. And in fact, in policing, it's less than even other professions. It's about 1%. So to make this broad category and statement that all police officers are bad, everyone who wears the badge is bad is just crap. Most of us really did join because we wanted to be in service. We wanted to do something greater than ourselves and help the community and protect and serve. As cliche as it sounds, that truly is why most of us join. But as civilians, something that you guys can do is speak up and speak out, like stop. That silent majority needs to stop being silent. It's time to say enough. Enough is enough. This is not okay. Our police officers are being attacked, are being ambushed, are being shot every 21 hours. They are attacked way more. That number is outrageous if you're to look at actual assaults on police officers. So what you can do is be unwilling to stay silent anymore. And when you hear that narrative, immediately denounce it because it's just false. It's complete lies. You know, it's time to hold people accountable. Um, a good friend of mine used to tell me all the time, nothing changes if nothing changes. It's like what Einstein said, where the definition of a sanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting something to change. It is time to hold criminals accountable for their actions. It is time to stop this narrative that um, even if the perception isn't that good because maybe it was a violent fight that the officer had to get into, but it was completely justified and legal, enough. That officer did what they had to do to survive and to protect that community. So don't be silent anymore. Uh, what's harder, internal politics or dealing with the public? Man, both are really hard. It didn't used to be. It used to be internally was the hardest. Uh, now, you know, I, I've dealt with multiple riots during multiple, multiple years uh, from an officer involved shooting to uh, BLM riots. And now it feels like we're the monster everywhere. You know, internally, it's, it's, a, it's like what, what Kevin has said. It's, it's not true leadership. Uh, oftentimes people are promoted for reasons that don't matter. It should be based on your ability to police and to lead. And many times people are promoted without any experience whatsoever and have never really done the job. And so of course, how would you be able to, to support your people? And oftentimes people just care about themselves and they just want to get to that next rank. Um, however, that's, there's so much to that. I'll just leave it at that. But you know what? There's also really good times. Um, there's moments of great, great moments with people that I've had where, um, you know, you make a difference and that's, that's really what keeps you going. It refuels you enough to, to make it to the next week and, uh, avoid that, that burnout that can happen. And ultimately when someone on the street says, thank you, uh, that's huge. Cause I didn't used to hear that very much. And, you know, I think not to get off, not to get off topic, but I think the breakdown of the family unit has really destroyed our culture. We need fathers in the home. We need parents to parent. We need to raise our children understanding moral, integrity, having good character, respect for others. You know, if you, if you address that from that beginning point, I think we would see a lot less of the violence and um, the crap that we see. So that's my little tangent. Okay. Policing from a woman's perspective. 
smaller in size and stature, not handicapped by any means, but however, when you arrive at a call with a male who's combative, what's your mindset and how do you handle this situation at hand? Example being a larger man, such as your husband. My husband is um, 6'4 and 200 and a lot, so he's a very big guy. Um, his presence, size, and strength, he likely approaches scenarios differently than you would, of course. You know, I am 5'4 on a good day, and I've always been a more petite individual. It, the big thing to remember is whether you're a female or not, smaller stature or not, you're not invincible. And when I started, I definitely had that kind of a, uh, a thought process. And part of that's just being young and naive, but you need to understand and know your limits and recognize that, you know, if you're fighting somebody five times your size, maybe it'd be best to wait for backup. I, there was a time when it was Christmas, working third shift, got a call that a guy who was wanted for attempted murder out of Georgia was at the Waffle House. So me, being the rookie that I was, didn't wait for backup like I knew I should have and went walking right on in. And it was truly like a Hollywood movie. That guy grabbed me. Um, he was sitting down eating his pancakes. And I walked over and I said, are you so-and-so? And he stood up and I remember I looked up at him and went, oh no, this was a terrible mistake. And he, I mean, he literally picked me up, threw me into the window, salt and pepper shakers went everywhere. And we, it was on, it was a brawl. And thankfully my backup wasn't that far away. We were able to handle it, but that was completely unnecessary. That should have never even happened. And that was because I didn't wait for my backup. Um, unless it's exigent, obviously there are times where you can't wait, you gotta go. You know, perfect example would be an active shooter situation. You go to the gunfire, if you're alone, you're alone. You go, you go handle business, that's what you signed up for. But for something like that, there's no reason why I couldn't have waited. Um, I will say personal presence is huge. There, are, there was a time where we had a shooting and the suspect vehicle passed me as I was pulling in. So I turned around, ended up pulling it over up the street. And I guess the way my command presence was during the traffic stop and my commands to him, by the end of it, he said, I'll talk, but I just don't want to talk to that. Well, he said, bitch, I don't want to talk to that bitch because she's going to kill me. And uh, my partner came over and told me and I was like, what? Because he was my husband's size and huge. So obviously personal presence can also help you out because you can do a lot just by how you hold yourself, how you talk to somebody and also partially things that I teach in, you know, my situational awareness class, even in the handbook that I, that I wrote, um, which is on our website, a ton of the stuff that I've learned throughout my years is in that. So, um, I think lastly, you, you got to work out and train really hard. I made sure I read every single law update so that when I made a decision, I knew that I was legally good, that I wasn't second guessing myself, which can cause you to really mentally mess yourself up. And I never wanted to be a liability. I wanted to be an asset. So <clears throat> I worked out like crazy and was as strong as I could be and wanted to just make sure that I was able to assist and be that asset for the guys and that they knew that they could rely on me and I would be there and I wasn't afraid of a fight and that I would get in there and make sure that I had their back. And that was probably, those are probably the biggest things that I'd say for a smaller statured person or a female. Um, <clears throat> For women looking to possibly step into the profession, what do you prepare yourself? What do you do to prepare yourself and what to stay away from when in the profession? That is a good question. Your reputation is all you have. That is everything. And it is uh, twice as hard to fix it if it is ruined. So I protected my reputation more than anything. And you're going to be as a female, this is just the reality of it. You'll be scrutinized 10 times as much as a male doing the exact same thing. If a female were to sleep around, she would be called a slut just trying to, you know, 
get into some position or whatever. Whereas a guy would probably be like, Hey, high five, way to go. Right. It's just, it's just different. It's the way it is. So your actions need to speak for you because your mouth will only go so far with people. Um, work hard, take every single call. Don't be lazy. Don't leave stuff to other people. There's plenty of lazy cops out there. Be dependable. Be someone who, when you see someone's being stacked with calls or dealing with a bunch of stuff, go in there and help them out. Take some of it from them. Um, be a, a critical thinker and a quick thinker. Good under pressure, under stress. Part of that is training. Train all the time. Train more than you get because you're not getting enough training. I promise you. You've got to take time, your personal time, to go train more and get with somebody that you trust that has a good reputation who's willing to take time out of their day and make you better because um, the more you do it, the better, the better you'll be for sure. Don't, um, don't be afraid to get dirty. I've already, I've already said that they need to know that you have their back. Never be a liability. Don't bring attention to the fact that you're a chick. Like, yeah, you're a chick. That's fine, uh, but you can still do the job and don't use it as an excuse. Like there's plenty of examples I could give, but just, just do your job and do it well and have their back and don't expect any special handouts and don't request any special handouts. Don't, don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. Keep your reputation sound and over time your actions will speak for you. So much so that when rumors happen, because rumors will always happen, they will not believe the rumors because they know you and they know your reputation. Um, there were so many rumors thrown out about me throughout my entire career. And after I had developed that reputation, I didn't care anymore because people knew me and they knew what would be true. And I didn't have to defend myself. And that was a great feeling. So... Uh, here's a good question from a friend. How do you prevent the creep of burnout emotionally? Uh, embrace the suck, but don't let it define you. There, it's impossible to avoid burnout. If you're in a big city and you're, you're working hard, it's just constant negative. You're getting negative from everywhere. And, and that's a hard thing to figure out. Uh, it took me a few years to understand how I needed to compartmentalize those things and successfully deal with them without them just draping me like a heavy coat or something. Uh, if you realize that that's happening, don't ignore it. Do something about it. Like understand the importance of relaxation and time away and, you know, alcohol. Just kidding. Just kidding. I know that's not a good thing, but, but seriously, like when you feel that burnout coming, maybe it's reading or it's going for a hike or camping or um, painting. You know, I, I used art as a way to get rid of that stuff that was inside of me so I could successfully continue in my career without it taking me out. So you've got to have some kind of an outside piece that's unrelated that you can release that. And I was talking to my husband about this and he laughed at me and was like, what the hell are you talking about? But hear me out. Burnout can be either like a parasite or a water balloon. Wait for it. Don't laugh too hard. So it can either suck the life right out of you and, and just make your life miserable, literally sucking you dry. Or it can be like a water balloon where it smacks you right in the face stings a little bit, you get a little bit wet, but maybe it'll piss you off for a moment or two and then it'll dry and everything will go back to normal and you'll just move on. And, and it won't have that, that suck still. It won't have the disease that comes afterward. So make your burnout a water balloon. If you've not learned anything today, I hope that one sticks with you because burnout can happen anywhere and everywhere. So just be aware of it 
to take care of yourself. And if you need help, get help. Man, policing and the military, there's such a stigma against the mental health stuff. Stop. If, if something's off, do something about it because it'll make you a better cop, a better friend, a better father, mother, brother, sister, wife, husband. You will be better because you dealt with it than ignoring it and letting it suck you dry. Be the water balloon. Okay. Ah, uh, freaking Kevin. Uh, how many phone books did you need in your patrol car? <laughs> okay. I, there is no shame in my game. So I'm just going to be legit and tell you that I absolutely had a booster seat. <laughs> well, we had old Crown Vicks when I first started and the first shifters were fat. And so it ended up being like a bucket seat and there was no way in hell, there was no way to raise the seats. There weren't buttons or anything. Nothing was like man or automatic. Everything was manual with the seat. So yeah, I had to have a freaking booster seat, but, um, you just do what you got to do. You don't complain about it. You don't ask for a nicer, better car because you don't deserve it. You're a rookie. Find, I went to AutoZone. I found it was actually a backrest and I put it underneath my seat and it ended up working perfectly. And you know what? I still could drive the hell out of that car. So we're all good. Um, <laughs> uh, one of my good friends says, how did God fit so much sass into such a small package? Well, he knew he had to adjust for my winning personality. So thank you for that question. Uh, next question, where did the idea of domestic violence not being a police problem come from? I'm not 100% sure what she means by this because domestic violence is 100% a police problem. You, that is not a situation where you can just have a social worker go in. They are too volatile. Um, they, there are, are so many issues when it comes to domestic violence. It's one of the most dangerous calls an officer can go on. Uh, but they're always back and back with traffic stops being the most dangerous and DVs. And last time I checked traffic stops were the most dangerous where DVs are close behind, meaning more officers are killed on those than anything else. But you know, they're very volatile. You can have two people who are enemies at one second. And then all of a sudden they're both fighting you because they don't want their baby daddy or whatever to go to jail. So it is a, a police problem when it gets to that point because a social worker or some other civilian can't handle that. They, they, they don't have the tools or the, the means and the training to be able to stop violence and um, successfully protect another person. I mean, you have to have tools to even the playing field like I preach all the time. So, you know, even with domestic violence, um, there, if there are signs of injury, we don't, you know, we get, uh, what's the word? Discretion. Jeez. We have discretion in a lot of things, not when it comes to domestics. You see signs of injury, period, someone is being arrested. They have to go to the jail. You don't have a choice. There is no discretion. They're going to jail. Um, they, in once they're in jail, they have to be in there for at least 48 hours. And all of this is North Carolina related, but most states have something very similar to that. And there's just been a ton of adjustments legally to attempt to protect these victims because what we see is that abuse may start with slapping somebody across the face and then it may lead to a broken wrist and then it could eventually lead to somebody losing their life and the goal is to try to stop that the goal is to try to prevent that from um, getting to the point where someone is losing their life or getting seriously injured because uh like I said, it's a very volatile situation. And oftentimes, as we know, normally the victim is a woman. Um, you, there's, they feel trapped. They feel like they can't get out. And there's a lot that goes into it mentally as well, which um, the social work side does come to play then. And there's a lot of tools and different programs and things to help women uh, work through that and escape it and move on with a happier, healthier life, not having to be abused by baby daddy. So but mom safety and response traveling tips. 
the best traveling tip I have is being situationally aware. It doesn't matter if you're going five minutes up the street or five hours to another state. You've got to be aware of your surroundings, especially when you've got babies, because you're going to be extra distracted. Um, as I always say, tools level the playing field. If you're not comfortable carrying a handgun, I get it. Not everyone is, and it takes time. And, you know, I'm not here to, to bash that. But if you don't want that, there are so many other options. There are tasers. There are uh, stun guns. There are... Um, like really good pepper spray that is police level. There's so many different things, all of which are on my Instagram and website that you guys can access and just give you that upper hand and give you a fighting chance because the, the reality is we're just not as strong as men. We weren't created that way. We do some epic stuff with our bodies, but for the most part, we're just not, not created as strong. Um, our muscles aren't as dense. Our lungs can't uh, intake as much oxygen, you know, there's tons of biological, uh, facts to that. So we got to level the playing field somehow. And that's how we do it. We use tools. If I, I mean, that's why police officers have an entire belt around their waist with tools, because if they had to fight everyone fist to fist, they, it, it'd be a bad day for a lot of police officers. So, um, last question. Oh, wow. We've got through this pretty quick. Good. Knowing everything you know about the system and all the pushback, would you do it again? Um, this is a great question, and I've I've actually thought about it multiple times. I I would, I would, and and that's hard to say with some of the the pain through the years, but it was an incredible job. I got so many opportunities. Um, I knew I wanted to do it since I was five and I didn't have any family or any, anyone, uh, close to me in policing. So it was very like, why was that on my mind since I was five? I don't know, but it was ingrained in me and, uh, you know, I wanted to make a difference and I feel like I really did get that opportunity to serve my community and to be a, a part of something that's bigger than me. And um, I've learned invaluable skills that I get to pass on every day to people. And I'm, I'm super grateful for all that I've learned and all the cool things I got to do. I mean, I got to protect presidents and meet incredible people. Um, the guys that I worked with were awesome. Like, yes, there's a bunch of F-tards too that made my life hell but for the most part I worked with some incredible men and women and the job was a freaking blast I loved actual just the the true job not having your hands tied not dealing with the internal politics and the external hate but the actual job it was fun man it's a it's a fun job and some people are just built for it and I was one of those people and I'm so grateful that I got the, the opportunities that I did. So thank you so much for uh, hanging out with me today and listening to me ramble. Probably talked way too fast and I'm now exhausted. So I've definitely talked enough. But uh, check out our website, guys. We've got uh, concealed carry classes coming up, precision rifle classes, tons of private classes if you want them. And of course, all the other merch and books that we've written. So Thank you so much and I'll see you next time.